Okay, so that, that takes us to 24 on the handout. Um, Bio-minimalist explanation and the new appeal to physiology. Um, as we've seen, a central step in the generative enterprise is to distinguish anatomy, the structure of the organism, from complex inter-organ behaviors made possible by the organized anatomy. That's roughly Chomsky's competence performance distinction. We conjecture that minimalism seeks a new form of explanation through physiological hypotheses concerning the language faculty. And by physiological, we mean inter-organ function. So the question bio-minimalist physiology seeks to address is, why do the organs have the internal structure or anatomy that we think they have? Why does the syntax have the anatomical structure it has? The hypothesis is in 25. One component of a biological system, for example, the syntax, can be understood as functioning so as to produce outputs whose properties meet or can meet or to a certain degree meet requirements imposed by neighboring components that take in these very outputs as their inputs. So as a biological parallel, one can ask, why is the heart, from a certain anatomical perspective, a pump? The answer, it's natural or explicable that it's a pump, since this organ functions within a larger system of organs so as to circulate blood throughout the organism. Note, the heart construed as a pump is not at the cellular level. At the cellular level, there is no pump. So we're at a higher level than cells. Uh, it's also obvious to us that we forget that originally the heart was thought to be the center of the emotions. Uh, Ernst Mayer relates the following, 26. When Harvey in the 1600s was asked what had induced him to think of the circulation of the blood, he answered, I wondered why there were valves in the veins. Evidently, they permit only a one-directional flow of the blood, and this, almost automatically, led to an assumption of circulation. One physiological discovery after another resulted from asking why questions concerning organs with unknown function, and the heuristic value of this methodology has by no means been exhausted. That's Mayer, 2004, talking about straight biology. Similarly, Gallistel, 2005, writes in 27, Harvey, in 1628, revolutionized physiological thinking when he showed that the heart circulates the blood and that its structure, or its anatomy, suits it to perform this function. Chomsky, 75, reconceptualized learning in his reflections on language. His reconceptualization is as radical in its implications for psychology and neuroscience as Harvey's work was for physiology." Close quote. Okay, so to take a concrete example, Chomsky's question is, why does the syntax operate as it does? Uh, and it's qualitatively similar, we believe, to Harvey's question, why does the heart do what it does? Chomsky's answer in terms of intercomponent function of the syntax seems to us comparably physiological. Chomsky's central idea, the syntax, for, the syntax formally operates in such a way as to satisfy the demands imposed by neighboring organs, the meaning system, and the sound system. Uh, so we seek to explain, through this kind of inter-organ physiological account, previously stipulated properties of organs, in this case syntactic mechanisms, in terms of their role in a larger contained system. Okay, so I'm going to try to give you an example of that. Recall that arguably the leading idea of the minimalist program is the following, 28 on the handout. The components of expressions, their features in standard terminology, must be interpretable by the systems, notice that's plural, by the systems that access them. The representations at the interface with sensory motor, that's just sound, and thought systems consist of interpretable features. Chomsky argues, we can regard an explanation of properties of language as principled insofar as it can be reduced to properties of the interface systems and general considerations of computational efficiency and the like. So there's now two levels of analysis emerging within bio-minimalist uh, theory. First, there's within organ anatomical analysis. We just want to know the structure of a particular organ. Uh, we need an, an analysis of the structure of the syntactic component, and we have good reason to believe that it's a recursive assembler displaying the property of discrete infinity. New kind of question, which is inter-organ physiological explanation of the anatomical structure. And that works like this, V or A function, V or A function of the syntax is to produce outputs 
that can be interpreted by the semantics and by the phonology, those are the adjacent organs adjacent to the syntax organ. Okay? Okay. Chomsky's most recent work, 2005, is on in 29, an excerpt in 29 in your handout. Quote, we can try to sharpen the question of what constitutes a principled explanation for properties of language and turn to one of the most fundamental questions of the biology of language. To what extent does language approximate an optimal solution to conditions it must satisfy to be usable at all given extra linguistic structural architecture? The expressions generated by a language must satisfy two interface conditions, those imposed by the sensory motor system, sound, and by the conceptual intentional system, meaning. So as a somewhat simplified and partly anachronistic, but I hope helpful illustration of this mode of explanation, whereby the anatomy of the syntax organ is partly explained by appeal to its inter-organ physiological function of having to meet the demands imposed by the sound and meaning interpreters, uh, consider 30. Uh, 30 is just a standard syntactic theory phrase structure rule a noun phrase consists of a determiner and a noun. Such a rule characterizes your knowledge that a noun phrase in English can consist of a determiner immediately followed by a noun. Such rules were initially stipulated, hence unexplained aspects of human linguistic cognition. The question, why do all syntactic systems of, by hypothesis, all human languages contain phrase structure rules, was unanswered, if ever even asked. A defining formal characteristic of such rules is that each one expresses two kinds of information, namely containment or dominance relations and precedence relations. For example, 30, the phrase structure rule, noun phrase goes to determiner noun, expresses your knowledge that 31, a noun phrase may consist of or contain two elements, namely a determiner and a noun. Equivalently, a set of the form noun determiner is known by you to be one kind of noun phrase and then it also specifies a second kind of information that the determiner precedes the noun. So it specifies containment information and precedence information. Okay, the minimalist question then is why are there phrase structure rules? Or why do human syntactic systems include such phrase structure rules specifying containment and precedence? Until recently, there was no answer. Uh, just like until Harvey, we didn't know why the heart was a pump. Uh, an answer under Chomsky's program is now emerging given physiological biolinguistic uh, analysis uh, and the appeal to physiological function, and that runs as follows. It's no accident or mystery that syntactic phrase structure rules specify containment and precedence relations. The semantics requires set representation or containment relations so that the semantic knows what is to be semantically composed with what. Thus, the syntax provides the semantics with unambiguous, unique assemblages. Thus, for example, the set representation assemblage in 32, old men and women, receives a compositional semantic interpretation different from the semantic interpretation assigned to the syntactic representation, a different assemblage, in old men and women. Uh, that's a physiological explanation of dominance or containment relations. Now, by contrast, the phonology or articulatory system cannot successfully implement or execute these semantically necessary containment or set representations, since, unlike semantic composition, articulation involves phonotemporal ordering in real time. That is, you can't, cannot say the dog all at once. Thus, it's no accident that the syntax also supplies ordering information or precedence relations. But that's to say we now have a physiological explanation for precedence. In sum, the syntax supplies the sound and meaning interpreters, the adjacent organs, representations they can execute. Syntax specifies containment, since this type of information is required for compositional semantic interpretation. Syntax also specifies order, since articulatory implementation requires it. That's biological explanation, or inter-organ physiology, if we're on the right track here. So we have 34. Thus, the fact that phrase structure rules, the very backbone of the standard theory of syntax, specify such information needs no longer be considered axiomatic or stipulated or unexplained, but rather becomes physiologically explicable in terms of the syntax producing representations that satisfy the demands imposed by adjacent organs, namely the interpretive components of sound and meaning 
which take the syntactic outputs as their inputs. Okay, so one might say uh, maybe that, okay, I see how this is biological in form in specifying the anatomy of single organs like the syntax and then trying to physiologically explain why the organs like the syntax have the anatomy they have, trying to explain their anatomy in terms of their function. But where's the minimalism in all this? Well, here's the or an answer. Notice that the phrase structural rules provide precisely containment information for the semantics and linear information for the phonology. And crucially, phrase structural rules provide no other information whatsoever, no other superfluous information. Phrase structure rules thus constitute not only a solution to the demands imposed by the interfaces of sound and meaning, but what Chomsky would call an optimal or minimal solution. Uh, they specify precedence relations for the phonology, the syntax specifies dominance relations for the semantics, and the system is minimal in that phrase structure rules specify no other information whatsoever. Precisely what the phonology needs, the semantics needs, and nothing else. So uh, what we've uh, attempted to do today, what we've tried to do today, is give uh, a non-technical exposition of Chomsky's biolinguistic minimalist program. We've considered some of the foundational issues of this approach, its, its appeal to physiology and anatomy in explanation, some aspects of the nature of science as it's practiced in this approach, and we've tried to convey some of the excitement that contemporary biolinguistic minimalism has generated um, and is generating, continues to generate across various fields, including uh, evolutionary biology, behavioral biology, neurology, and of course, uh, the many different subfields of linguistics. Thank you. Thank you.